Hey guys, how's it going? So this is actually our weekly recap video, but I wanted to start over here on the west side to update you on how our white tulips are doing because they are gorgeous. Look at them. These are the Vidal Tulip Blend from Color Blends. And if we get in here close, you can see how many different varieties this blend has. So first off, you can see just a classic pure white, clean tulip. Then we've got one that's got a green stripe up the side. Same one right here has three, look at that. I'm not sure I've seen that before. And then we've got the fringed ed edged tulip and there are some doubles as well. Just take a look at that. It came up strong. I was actually a little nervous there for a minute because I thought they were gonna be short. Um, but once we got our drip system turned on and they got more consistent water, they just shot up. And then from this angle, this is where you enter the brick pathway, but you can see we're dealing with a little bit of different light, so I'm not sure how much detail you can see, but first two are in a little bit more shade in the morning, and then they're all in the sun, like midday through the end of the day. But they're just so beautiful. I just wanted to make sure you guys got to see them at their peak. And here's what they look like walking down the pathway. I am really excited for this moon garden concept on this side of the house, just because these really do glow. Like you can see how much they pop in a shady spot. They're like that at night too. They really do shine. Oh, Russell, what are you doing down there? Russell's balled up on one of my plants. Do you see him? And then we've got the Purissima blonde tulips in the urns with the white blooms. They started off a little bit more blonde and then they've aged out to more of a white with the beautiful leaves. So if that plant doesn't survive, I'll know why. Russell, quit, you are like breaking all the branches. What are you doing? Look what you've done. Oh, naughty, naughty kitty. You broke no less than four branches on this shrub and it's a baby. How dare you? We also have the same blend of tulips that I planted year before last um, around our fireplace that I'll show you how well they've come back. So this is their second year in our garden. Look at that. They came back with a vengeance. Like, I don't think we are missing any in this area. They all came back beautiful and tall and full. A little bit of a random way to start today's recap video, but I just wanted you guys to see that. And we are gonna do something of a bulb tour, but what we've been doing is trying to go around and collect pictures and video of all the different sections of bulbs when they're at their peak, because it's really hard to pick a specific time to do a bulb tour because everything blooms at such different times that we would miss some things. So anyway, be watching for that at some point. Now we're heading to the greenhouse for the video. Okay, so now let's get into the recap video. I'm gonna answer questions from last week's videos. The first video was planting shade loving perennials. So in that video on the west side of our house, I planted some beautiful silver gumdrop hookahs and crested surf ferns. I'm loving it over there already. I mean, I still have a lot of space to plant up, but it's starting to feel like it's coming together. First question is from Laura. When you tell us about a specific kind of plant from PW or Proven Winners, am I gonna be able to find it at a local nursery grown by anyone else? For instance, the Colorblaze Coleus. I can't find a lot of PW in my area and can't afford to order them. Is it likely that I'll see them from anyone other than PW? And the answer to that is no. Um, Proven Winners, plants are proven winners because they own the genetics on those plants. They've sunk in a ton of money and research and time into growing these and testing these plants. The way it works is that growers, like local growers, will buy plugs from proven winners and they will grow them on, which are then sold to your local garden centers, which are then sold to you. Um, so like my parents' garden center, they order from a place called Moss Greenhouses and Moss Greenhouses buys a bunch of proven winners plugs. They grow them on and that's how my parents get a lot of their proven winners plants. Um, so there is, like you said, there is a place that you can order online from Proven Winners uh, if you don't have a local resource. But I would talk to your local garden centers. If you're not seeing those Colorblaze Coleus show up, it's likely that they could research some other local growers or maybe they just haven't experiment experimented with those yet and maybe their grower is offering them. So just talk to them and oftentimes they can order them in for you. Uh, next is from Max. Does anyone know what she throws in the powder before planting the plants? That is the Espoma Organic Biotone Starter Fertilizer. I throw that in with everything I put in the ground. Uh, Lindsay said, love those hookahs. I have a shady spot I need to put something in and those just might be the plant. I also have a west facing very sunny spot and I would love a hydrangea there, but I think it would get too much sun. Do you know of any specific ones that might do good? So we have been pushing our hydrangeas to their limits here in our garden, just because like the paniculata and arborescens 
um, hydrangeas, they do call for full sun. A lot of them do. And in fact, a lot of them need four to six hours of sunlight in order to perform and do really well, like to do the best that they can do. I always thought though in our area, because it's so hot and so extreme and there's hardly ever cloud cover or rain, I always thought that they couldn't handle full sun. But we have found like with hydrangea limelights, with the Incrediballs, with uh, quick, little quick fire, quick fire, pinky winky, fire lights, all of those hydrangeas do well in full sun as long as they get enough water. So like I've got some planted right next to our vegetable garden, which is full sun all day long. And I found as long as they got water every single day, they do super well. And I think we could pop a picture up on the screen, in fact, and show you how well they've done. Next from Presley, what size Felcos do you have? I purchased the medium size because the smalls are impossible to find, but they were too big. So I'm not sure what the medium size equates to in terms, because they're all labeled um, like Felco two, six, seven. There's a whole bunch of numbers. Is there, do you know if they like say large, small, medium? I haven't even noticed if they do. Anyway, the size I use that I love that seems to be the most universally used are the Felco twos and they are awesome. Prairie Farm Girl said, does your home run off septic? Is it, hold, is it a holding tank or a field or are you connected to the city infrastructure? So we have septic. It is, we have a, both a tank and a field. It's actually right under Versailles. That's why there's only grass planted, like in those little jelly bean shapes. That's our septic field, right? Like it goes out towards our neighbor's house. So we have to be extremely careful of that area right there. And that's why we haven't done a whole lot. We did have to have the tank pumped uh, last spring which is a totally gross process, but the tank is actually right underneath um, the biggest birch tree. I actually had to dig up a couple of the boxwoods to access the lid right there at the very beginning of our hedge. Kelsey said, is there an additive you would suggest for clay soil? I have a full shade flower bed that never gets all the way dry despite, of our, despite our high temps. And I think it's killing my hydrangea. How can I improve the soil so it's well draining and doesn't stay wet? I had that exact problem in our last garden. It takes gypsum and a lot of it to help break that up and condition that soil and help it drain better. So what I do is every time I plant a new plant in an area that was like that, I would put a handful of gypsum at the bottom of the hole along with my starter fertilizer. And then I would add gypsum two or three times a year and I would even add it to my grass like I'd put the pelletized gypsum in my push spreader my broadcast spreader and I would spread it over flower beds over the grass and I found if I was consistent with it and applied it at least two to three times a year it was really helping it took a couple years to really start seeing the results of it in the ground but when we very first moved in I could dig down like this far and it would the soil would turn like gray and it would stink and smell swampy and by the time we left we stayed in that house for eight years but by the time we left i could dig way down and the soil was crumbly and loose and there were earthworms in it and so it was really working uh shilpa says laura how long have you been using those cheetah print sneakers uh for a long time and multiple different versions of those. I've like, they are customs from Vans, which it's actually not that expensive to do customs on their website. It takes forever to get them, like six to eight weeks to get them. But I usually order one new pair a year and that's what I use in the garden until they are just about tore apart. And then I order myself a new pair and they are super comfortable. Cheryl said, since you tapped into the water, will the Limetta hydrangeas receive the same amount of water as the coral bells and the ferns? Are they all in the same kind of emitters? No. And that's the beauty of doing uh, individual emitters to plants in areas like that, like the Limetta hydrangeas have two two gallon per hour emitters, one on each side of their root ball, while the ferns and the hostas and the hookeras all down there have a one one gallon per hour emitter uh, because the Limettas just tend to need, need more uh, water because they get more sun um, and it's all adjustable. So if you figure out that you need something different, you can clip off that emitter, put something different on or add another one. Um, and so far I'm noticing everything's doing really well over there with what we've got it set up on. Shauna asked, did you ever open that thunder egg? Uh, so we haven't yet. It's still sitting in the exact same spot where we found it. We've been meaning to do it for like years now. Um, we obviously have to wait now and uh, we will wait because the place where we were going to take it is the first place where the coronavirus, like there was confirmed cases in the employees that worked there. So yeah, we'll do that later. And the last question on that video was from Rebecca. Totally not a gardening question, but I have to know what brand of jeans do you wear and what hair products do you use? And I thought I would answer that quick just because I do see that question every week. So the brand of jeans I wear is American Eagle. I'm not sure of the exact style. I do know that they're not offering that style in the stores anymore. You have to order it online. Um, and they're just like skinny jeans. Um, I have to order them in the short size because I'm short. <laughs> um, they've always fit really well for me. And then the hair products that I use, I don't really use a lot of fancy things like shampoo and conditioner. I don't really mess with that because um, 
that this whole thing is kind of out of my wheelhouse. Like I, I like plants and that's what I'm into, but I do use cheese silk infusion. So CHI, we'll link it down below. Uh, but I put that in my wet hair after I'm done with my shower and it helps because my hair is naturally curly. And so it helps it smooth out when I'm straightening it. Okay, next video is planting strawberries in containers for beginners. And in that video, I planted some really pretty buried treasure red and buried treasure pink strawberries in a galvanized container uh, and just kind of went through some of the basics. D said, love the video on strawberries in a container. I have the same question as two other people. I also live in zone five. Will I be able to winter the plants in my garage? And also when would I stop watering them? Um, so yes, you could put them in your garage once they've gone dormant and you do wanna make sure to keep them on a, somewhat of a watering schedule. You cannot let them dry completely out um, because that will make them not come back. They will die if you let them dry completely out. So usually an every two week watering schedule, you go and just make sure that you've tossed a little bit of water in there to keep some amount of moisture is perfect. Now, I've wintered strawberries outside in containers and had pretty good luck, even though I do live in a zone five. I think these strawberries I used are a zone four. Um, so that's probably why they have survived. And then I've started to move anything that is mobile out in our garden that I can move into this cold frame. I do that now, um, which has really helped. Teresa asked if already planned like that, how do you add that type of fertilizer? Again, if you try mixing in soil, you might mess roots up, wouldn't you? So you just um, sprinkle it on the top and then just kind of scratch it in with your fingers. There's no like mixing it up in the soil the next time that you fertilize. Yvonne said, does the soil need to be so deep or can you use filler on the bottom? So for the container I used, like strawberries are very shallow rooted plants. So you don't need to have a super deep container. And in this case, I used a galvanized tub that really wasn't that deep. And in our area, I feel like having that soil and not using a filler is beneficial in that it helps insulate the root ball root balls when you're trying to winter them over. It also helps retain moisture and helps keep everything a little bit cooler. If you had them in something bigger than that, it you know you might put some filler at the bottom because those roots will never reach it and they don't really need it. Um, so that is an option if you want to. Gail said, we have strawberries taking over our veggie garden and I wanna move them to a container. Do you have any suggestions on keeping the birds away? They're taking them as soon as they start to turn red. So you're gonna to have to net them. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of bird netting you can buy and you can buy it in all different kinds of sizes as well. So you could cut it to the size you need and just you're gonna to have to tent your containers with bird netting to keep them out. You gonna do some watering? Okay, you just don't water your mother. Passion for Plants said, is there a reason why you used a straight coupler instead of a T for the drip tubing? You could e use either or. In fact, if you had the exact amount right of um, amount of drip tubing, you could just connect it back to itself, which is perfect. I just had grabbed the straight coupler and the plug because I didn't know how much tubing I had and if it would make it all the way around the pot. Uh, CJ said, you did strawberries once in a white tall container that had holes around it. Was it a plastic camper? Yes. How did they do? Fair. Uh, you also planted some in long tubes that had round holes in them. How did they do? They did excellent. And I think I've either got a video or picture of what they looked like kind of mid-season. They did so well. We actually had those hooked to a drip system, so they had consistent water. Benjamin's taking care of business right now. <laughs> all in his water tank around. Uh, and then you also did strawberries close to Benjamin's play area. How did those do? So I had those in the green stock vertical garden and I did a strawberry calendula, strawberry calendula. And they did really well for the first part of the year until the calendula got huge. And so I really didn't give those strawberries a fair shake because I didn't realize that calendula would grow that big. And so it kind of took over the strawberries a little bit. Um, yeah. Marianne said, I love that metal planter. Where did you get it? I think I got that at DMB, which is a local feed store. And you can find those usually, I think you can get them at box stores, maybe at your local garden center. We used to carry a galvanized line a while ago, uh, but feed stores are excellent for finding things like that and troughs that you can plant and all kinds of things. Alicia said, I'm gonna do this, but can I use any top dress such as rocks? Is a top dress necessary? Uh, so I think the top dress is necessary. I mean, you don't have to. People grow strawberries in the ground all the time and they don't put anything around them. But the benefit of using straw or something very similar to that is it keeps the berries up off of the soil, which helps them stay nicer. Um, they don't deal, you don't deal with rot as much. Uh, you can use rocks, I think, if you lived in a more mild climate. I don't think we could do it here because I think with all of the heat and everything, I think, I don't know. I mean, I've never tried it, so I can't tell you that it wouldn't work, um, but I don't, I probably wouldn't do that. 
Amy said, just curious why you use berry tone instead of biotone. I'm a complete beginner and your videos have a, uh, been a priceless wealth of information, which makes me really happy to hear. Um, so I, you could use either one. You could use biotone or berry tone. They would both be great fertilizers to start off with. If you use the biotone to begin with, then when you do your consecutive fertilizings, I would use the berry tone um, because it's specifically formulated for berries. Sherry said, I'm anxious to see where you're gonna put it. Sounds so wonderful and it's beautiful. How long will it take for Benjamin to find the fruit? Well, I put it in the corner of the vegetable garden and Benjamin has already found it. Yeah. Wait. Mm. Alexandra said, could you plant raspberries in a container? Absolutely. Uh, so you do wanna make sure you have you know, a sizable enough container to keep the berries happy, especially if you're growing traditional varieties of raspberries because they do want to spread and fill in the area that they're in. There are specific raspberries that stay smaller though, like dwarf types. I, I can't remember the brand. What's that brand, Erin? They have the small raspberries bushel and berry is that right so they have a specific raspberries that stay smaller that are suitable for container growing and i don't know what the difference is in yield um, but yeah absolutely something to plant in containers uh, tammy said just curious do you keep a garden journal or log when you plant your plants so that you know which fertilizers you used on which plants and when they need to have new applications I don't. The only thing I have are videos. And if I ever am desperate for some information, I can hopefully find it in a vlog or in some sort of video. Um, and it's usually only a plant name that I'm looking up, but I've got it pretty much for the most part dialed in in my brain, what things need what and when, and everything's been on somewhat of the same schedule for so long that it's kind of ingrained. The next video is moving gravel and placing an urn in our new walkway. So this video and the next one centered on that area of our garden, which I have to say, I absolutely am loving it. I love that spot so much. We're gonna throw a couple of pictures up on the screen. I took one from each side of that walkway, just kind of showing it almost in better context. I feel like on video, it's hard to capture like scale. For some reason, when I'm um, watching videos back, I'm like, that does not look the same as it does in real life. And I wish everybody could be here to see it especially once I read the comments. <laughs> it was kind of like, I don't think it was 50-50. I think most people really loved it, but then there was a, a handful of, of you guys who were like, oh, don't love the gravel, or it doesn't look like it's um, the right scale, uh, but it's not done yet either. So have a little bit of faith in the end result, because once I add some plants around it, it'll bring weight and it'll bring the fluff it needs around it to make it look exactly proportioned. And I can see it because I know what plants are gonna be in there. And I'm excited for you guys to see the end result, but I think that has, like risen very quickly to be one of my favorite spots on the property. Um, and I think I'm gonna want to spend a lot of time cultivating that area and I'm gonna have fun like masking the AC units. And I know that it looks like there's a lot going on over there and it does right now, um, but I'm hoping to get some things going around those AC units, which I don't even mind being on the side of the house, you guys. Like I know it can be a pain to have those kind of things to work around, but I'm so thankful that we were able to move in particular, particular the one on the far side that we moved from the very front of the house. It's so much better where it's at now than it was. Anyway, that's a whole tangent, but I'm loving the area. Natalia said, do you plant plants into mulch or in the bad ground underneath? So I do scoot the mulch aside and I do plant right into our native soil. I add in a lot of biotone starter fertilizer when we uh, plant. If it's really a hard area, I'll add gypsum as well. Um, but eventually, once we do all of our fertilizing, we do all of our amending with the um, gypsum, eventually our soil does turn better. So yeah, I do plant into the ground, not into the mulch. Barb said, I love the Galloway urn. Question, if you silicone the bottom, oh, this is a huge question you guys had. If you silicone the bottom of the bowl, how will you have any drainage? I know you won't overwater with the drip, but in a rainstorm, won't you have floating plants? So I'm not, I'm a little confused over how come there was so much confusion over this because the thing that I put that putty around was where the bowl connected to the pedestal. That was not the drain hole. The reason I did that and sealed that was so that no water oozed out and got all over the pedestal because we have such hard water. But if you look in the center of that bowl, you see a large round metal opening where the drip tube came up through that's the actual drain hole. So all the water is gonna be draining properly out of the bottom of that container. No worries, plants will be happy. Grace said, did you put in the brick walkway? Do you have a video on that? We did not put in the brick walkway. Aaron and I know our limits in terms of projects. We look at stuff like that. Like if it's small, we did the little walkway in front of our gazebo, we will do it. But we look at the time and effort it takes to put in something like that. And also our expertise level, it, 
with that kind of project, it's not very high. Like I tend to be a type who's not super detailed and I will maybe do something improperly just to get it done. And Erin is the type who wants to research every step and do the proper things, buy all the proper tools. We don't meld or mesh very well on big projects like that. So we know our limits and we hire professionals. So we had um, a professional come in and put in that walkway and he did a beautiful job, him and his crew. Carol said that is the most beautiful urn ever. It is. As much wind as you get, are you at all concerned that it might fall over? No. You guys, that urn is so extremely heavy. The base is, it's like all that Aaron can do to even move it. Like he has to, we were, we got out and got it all centered. Both of those videos, the urn was not centered, nor was it leveled. <laughs> and afterward, I was kind of looking at it and I'm like, this doesn't look right. We need to get it positioned better. So we got the tape measure out and we got it all fixed and everything. And it's hard to move. Um, but that leads into the next question. Kate said, and this was another huge concern, are you worried about Benjamin knocking over or climbing on your taller concrete pieces, especially top heavy ones? And honestly, it's not something I consider very often just because I grew up around stuff like that. I grew up around all the poisonous plants. I grew up around all of the concrete pieces and we were just taught what we could and couldn't do and it was never a problem. And I know that that's like, I shouldn't put too much confidence in that. And it's always good to have that reminder. And that bowl on the top, it is fairly wobbly. Like if you touch it and are messing with it, I mean, you could tip it over. He can't reach it at this point and there's nothing for him to climb on. So I'm not like worried about it immediately. Um, but it's something to consider for sure. Like I could put a little concrete adhesive in between or concrete glue or whatever in between the bowl and the pedestal to keep it together. Or I could even run a piece of rebar down the drain hole because it's such a large drain hole. I could run it down and have it come up into the bowl a little way. So even if it did like tip and slide a little bit, it would catch on the rebar. I'm using a pillow as my table today because I have a really low chair. So sorry about my wobbly computer. Um, anyway, so there's always somebody with Benjamin too. And not to say that he like, we're giving him a lot more freedom now, you know, now that he's a little bit older and we let him venture a little bit further. So it's something definitely to consider, but I'm not super worried about it. He's also a really compliant child. He's a pleaser, you guys. Like he, he will test things, um, but he'll look at you. Like he'll, he'll kind of like, he knows he's not supposed to touch something and he'll like put his finger out and he'll look at you with kind of a smile and he won't do it, but he's just watching to see what you'll do. And you can ask him like, cause he knows he's not supposed to throw rocks. And so we'll ask him, Benjamin, what happens when you throw rocks? And he'll tell you what happens or what happens when you touch the key on the gator. And he knows like he learns pretty quick and he wants to please. We got lucky. Jen said, I've been hearing that tulips have a three-ish year lifespan, but I remember my mom's popping up all through my childhood. How long do you expect all your bulbs to last? You know what? I never really know because I'm always trying out so many different kinds of bulbs. Some return amazingly well, like what I just showed you, that Vidal or Vidal mix from Color Blends, amazing. I have others that aren't coming back as strong, like the Pinotage Blend behind the chicken coop. It came back, but there's one variety, the one that had the green in it, I think I've seen one. So maybe that specific variety in that blend wasn't as strong as the others, so it didn't come back. I just never know. Um, there's some that you stumble on and like hold on to those. And like, if you can get more of those that t uh, tend to come back in your garden better, then, you know, plant heavy on those. But it's fun to experiment and try out because you never know what you'll find and what reacts the best in your garden. I am going to be planting heavier on daffodils this fall though because they are always the best to come back. And they're so beautiful and they're so early. Haley said, will you have a way to light up the urn planter? I'm sure Aaron will figure out something so that it's softly lit in the evenings. And it's funny you said that because I just told Aaron that I think we need to get a couple of lights like right before I read your comments. So that is on the radar. Graceful Living said, did you choose the ancient aged color? I did for that Galloway urn just because I wanted to try something a little bit different. I usually go with all natural concrete because I like the look of it and it takes our hard water really well. Like it doesn't show the hard water stands as bad as other stain colors but I knew that like just with this one piece it wasn't gonna be touching like the sprinklers weren't gonna be hitting it it wasn't gonna be around any extra water and I knew I was gonna be plumbing drip to it so all the water is gonna be draining through the drain hole and out the bottom so I thought it was a really good opportunity to try that color and I really like it. Heath said what happened to the blue kazoo spirea that was on the side of your house I transplanted that last fall when we knew we had to get a new AC unit on the side of our house so I had to dig that one up and a um, limelight hydrangea standard. I did it in a vlog and I planted them over on the west side and it's coming back really nicely. I think it'll actually do a lot better because it's going to get the sun it needs over there. Arthur said, are you still planning on replacing the sidewalk for brick in front of the house this spring? 
So we had planned on doing that and we had, that was kind of the next phase. We were gonna rip up all the concrete and the gray paver walkway that goes out to the front arbor and have all of that replaced with brick. But we kind of put a hold on it because the new land is going, like the new property and everything that we're doing up there, it's going a lot faster than we thought it was. So we wanted to allocate, you know, more of our funds toward that and to get water set up and all of that business. But I think we're gonna do something a lot more major up front. I think we're going to be blowing a lot of that out, including the driveway and I think we're going to be extending our yard all the way out into the new property like a considerable amount so that it connects the two pieces of property so we decided to wait on that because we're not sure how we're going to want that whole walkway configuration to be after that project which most likely won't happen this year um, because we've got a lot of other things going on. So we just decided to take a step back and wait on that. And the last one from that video, Jennifer said, my back is breaking watching you move that rock. It looks great, thank you. You mentioned your lilac tree that you're going to remove. At what point is one beyond salvageable? And can you cut it down to half its size once done blooming to encourage more blooms and foliage for next year? You can do a few different things. You could cut it back by however much you want. It's called a rejuvenation prune. Some people will even take an entire plant down all the way to the ground, like take everything out and let it flush back fresh. And I considered doing that with that lilac right there. A lot of our old lilacs have borers really, really badly. So some of the branches that I cut off last year from one of our big lilacs, I could just see all the bore holes going through it. And so they're really weak. They're really old. They never had been treated with a systemic insecticide to keep the borers out, um, which there's pros and cons to doing that as well. So I think what I'm going to do with that lilac right there, before we take it out, I might try to prune it like I did the one by the fireplace. And I showed you that in a video it really made that one beautiful. And while I don't think it's going to last forever because it's so weak, it did give us at least hopefully another few years of enjoying that plant right there. Um, so I'm gonna try to do that pruning on this one just to clean it up, clean up all that undergrowth and maybe cut out some dead branches. And then we'll step back and see if it even looks like any looks like much because I don't know what will be left at the end of that but I would love to be able to keep that just for the shade and the structure for right now so we'll probably do a video or set up a camera at that point just to show you guys that whole process next video was the planting up of that new urn with cold tolerant annuals so I used the bright lights pink osteospermum the African daisy and then the bluebird nemesia and the snow globe bacopa such a beautiful soft blend I really am enjoying it Christina said, I believe I heard you note that it was a bit too early to plant supertunias. What temperature would be optimal for planting such heat loving plants? Typically, we don't even think about planting supertunias until sometime in May. Usually around Mother's Day or the week after is when we start feeling like it's safe to plant those things. It will be different for every area and I'm not even sure what temperature that is, but I know that that means like nights are in well into the upper 40s usually in our area. No danger of frost. Uh, Thomas says, can you make a video update of the church landscape you did last year? Also, your relative's front yard with the rocks would be great as well. We will be doing updates on the church landscape for sure. Of course, we haven't been able to go um, to church for quite some time, and I don't know how much longer that's going to be, but we do plan on doing some updates there. Now, the relative's front yard that we were working on with the rocks, they've sold that house to somebody else. So we were kind of in the middle of that project, so I'm a little bit bummed that we won't be able to finish it, but it was coming along, and I knew I know the new owner was excited to kind of take over. She was excited about the plants and how it was going. And so I think she'll have fun with it, but our videos will cease to be at that house anyway. Ryan asked at the 32 second mark, what is the type of evergreen on the right? That is a weeping white spruce. We did a video about that. We'll link it down below. Uh, Molly said, your videos always brighten my day, Laura, which is super sweet. We always ask about where you get your ideas from, but not always the in-depth knowledge. I always wonder how you are so organized and working beautiful with the seasons. I'm glad it appears that way. Has this knowledge been acquired through life and time working at the garden center? Do you go to your parents or any other sources for seasonally conscious, conscience, conscious video ideas? How far in advance have you held onto a video idea? Um, so, you know what, we do videos as they come up naturally for the most part. I'm not uh, super great, and I've talked about it, I'm not good at planning and organizing. In fact, I lose interest really fast. So if I even, like myself, like if I come up with an idea for a video, and if we somehow, like our schedule isn't allowing us to get it done, if it goes more than a week, I've lost interest. Like, I don't want to do that project anymore, let's move on to something different because I was excited about it that day, but I'm not excited about it now. Like I can't, I'm not the type of person which, that could like plan out my pots. Um, I can't like look at that pot four months ahead in advance and pick out everything I want and then do that. 
because I change my mind too quickly and I'm the type who wants to look at the plants, like them, put them in that planter that day or the next day. And so a lot of the time we'll like pitch an idea because we'll like set out to do a video and um, we'll all kind of be geared up for it. Hey baby. And then I'll run across some really pretty beautiful plant and I'm like, nope, Erin, we got to do this one because this plant is gorgeous and I want to do a video about it today. Um, so that's another reason why like for seasonal like holiday stuff, we only do really what I'm actually doing. So we do heavy on Christmas because I do a lot of Christmas decorating, but you don't really probably notice we do, a, we don't do a lot for Easter, Valentine's, 4th of July, um, Thanksgiving. We only do it if it comes up naturally and it's something that we want to do. And you guys, all the hammering, there is a house being built across the street here. So I don't know how much of that is picking up in the audio, but it seems pretty loud to me. Uh, winner for life said, Laura, I bought some ghost honeysuckle when I saw yours and I can't get them to germinate. Um, I read you can't start them from seed. How did you get yours started? I bought mine as plants. Uh, my parents get them in at the garden center in one gallon cans. I do think that there is a resource online. Uh, what is it, Great Garden Plants? We'll see if we can find a link and put it down below. But I've never tried to germinate them from seed. I don't really know a lot about that. Uh, Isabel said, love the daisies, they're beautiful. Are you gonna do an April garden tour? I'm so looking forward to the tours. I think we're gonna try to do an April garden tour. We are piecing together a bulb tour, like I said earlier. We're going out as things look at their peak and getting some footage and stuff. But I do think an April garden tour would be good. We're kind of waiting for some nice overcast weather. And right now it is 100% blue skies and bright sun. And it's really hard to do tours in a full Sunday. So hopefully we'll get a good day here in the next week or so and put together a tour. Uh, Melissa said, are those daisies new or can we get them now? You can get them now. Pup lover, that urn looks so pretty. Just curious, do you ever take a vacation? No, <laughs> we haven't gone on a vacation in like six years. Now we have gone on several trips, but they're work trips and it's like maybe 10% vacation, 90% work. <laughs> One of these days, Erin, we're getting things so dialed in here. We're getting things automated and things are working so much better that this year we've actually been able to take weekends. Like if we want to, we can take weekends and just do the bare minimum of watering in the greenhouse and things um, and just checking on things. But if we, it's, we don't feel like we have to work. And before it was like, nope, if you have extra time, you have to work. Like this is your only time that you can get it done and you've got to do it. Otherwise you're going to get way behind. Um, so we've got things in place, you know, with Chris helping out here and we've got Ken who helps us with editing and it's just, everything is working so much smoother to where it feels like life is becoming a little bit more relaxing and we're trying to get in, actually get used to that new pattern, but it's really quite nice. And Dana, last question from this one. So pretty, did you use the brown drip tubing with emitters every 18 inches up into the urn and not the solid black tubing? So the type of tubing they use, they use a different brand. The landscaper did that. He put the brown tubing up and it's solid. There's no emitters in it. It's just a different brand than we're, we're used to using. We're used to using the black solid poly tubing. So no worries there no emitters along the way on that one. Next video was raised bed guides for beginners. We just went through a bunch of the most asked questions we get about raised beds. Um, so we talked about what materials to build them out of, what to fill them with, what to grow in them, etc. Uh, Debbie said, can you please talk about cool season crops and if you can plant those more than once per season or if you can plant cool season seeds, harvest them and then plant something else in that spot. Yeah, so cool season crops, you start them in the cool season and then you once you harvest them you can plant other things tomatoes sometimes i throw zinnias in i'll throw in a late crop of corn or whatever and then you can plant your cool season crops again like late summer for a fall harvest isha michelle said i would love to know what is the foundation under your raised beds other than obvious gravel of course there's no gravel underneath our raised beds so when we had that done we rolled out landscape fabric we set our beds down then we cut the fabric out from underneath our beds so there's actually native soil underneath all of our beds I don't think our plants ever make it to that soil because they're all fairly shallow rooted, even the root crops. Um, I don't think they make it all the way down there, but they can if they want to. And I like the thought that if something needs extra soil reservoir, they've got all they need down below those raised beds. But if you're uh, planting on really bad soil or even putting a raised bed like on a concrete surface, because you can do that, you do wanna make sure that your beds are at a minimum 10 to 12 inches deep. More would be even a little bit better, but you still can grow right on top of a hard surface as long as you've got a big enough reservoir like that. Uh, Sarah said, what are those plastic bell things in the background? Those are uh, protective covers from Gardener Supply. They protect crops from freezing temperatures. I've actually picked mine up. They're not out there anymore because it's warm enough now. 
Jackson said, do you mind if I ask where you got your cold frame? We got it from Farm Tech. It's a Gothic arch cold frame. Uh, Nate said, I've never seen you use miracle Grow. Is there a specific reason or do you just prefer Espoma and Proven Winners? So in my early days of gardening, I used miracle Grow a little bit and I noticed one time, like one year, it was like the mix had changed. It was fine before and then um, like the entire batch we got, it was full of wood. Like you could smell that wood smell and my hands were full of slivers. And I don't know if it's still like that because it's been a really long time. I'm seeing the sun is like moving in toward me. Anyway, um, it's been a long time since I've used it, but I've switched everything to try to use as much organic things as I can. And before, like earlier on, it was harder to find a Spoma brand soil or Proven Winners brand soil. And I think um, that was because the Spoma was more heavily distributed, distributed on the eastern side of the country. And I think they're trying really hard to have it better distributed over on the western side. So it's something hopefully even going forward from now, it'll be easier and easier to find because the Spoma soil has worked so, so well for everything that we've done around here. Okay guys, I gotta move into a different spot. The sun is moving in quickly. I'm taking way too long. All right, so I think this spot might work for the rest of the video. Christina said, how can I tell if seeds I'm purchasing are not GMO? And I feel like I'm opening a can of worms by even answering this question. So I'm gonna link three articles down below if you wanna read further, but in short, I'm not sure, like to my knowledge, that you can even buy GMO seeds. I don't think that home gardeners have access to them. So when you go to a garden center or even a box store, you're looking at the packets of seeds, none of them are GMO. Uh, and you might notice that some of the packets say that they're non-GMO and some don't. And some companies are labeling their seeds as non-GMO because there's so much negativity surrounding those words. And I'm not taking a stance here, just sharing factual information. Uh, but there's so much negativity surrounding that word that just by merely printing it on their packets, it gives the buyer more confidence in those seeds even though all of them that they're looking at are non-GMO, if that makes sense. So I think that that could be a video all its own. And I think we might put something together just talking about that and, and really just talking about all the different types of seeds, like the groups like open pollinated versus heirloom versus hybrids and all of that. I think that it's always really interesting information. So that might be a video here in the near future. Next from Candy, I'm curious about the raised beds that are about three feet tall. Did you fill the entire bed with soil? We did because we had a lot of leftover soil from our our garden project, our vegetable garden project that we needed to put somewhere so it was kind of perfect. You do not have to fill beds that tall all the way with soil because all of the stuff we're putting in there, typically I'm gonna be planting something in one of my raised beds today that's gonna to need that whole reservoir and we'll have a video about that uh, for you. But typically if you're growing vegetable crops or fruit crops, you don't need that much soil reservoir. So you can fill the bottom with something if you want to. I mean, people have used like big chunky bark. You can even put garden debris down in there, almost like a, a compost pile in the making. So if you've got non-disease, non-insect ridden things that you've cut out of your garden, fill the bottom of your bed with that and then put your premium soil on the top. And that way it saves you some money um, and it's a little bit less work actually. Uh, Melissa said, do you ever start beans inside or do you direct sow those or do you even grow them at all? We do grow beans, we always direct sow. We never start those inside. Maureen said, I may have missed it. What is the depth of the Redwood raised garden? It, we use two by 12 boards for that. Uh, Wendy, can you tell me where you got the arch you have at the entrance to your garden? We ordered those off of Amazon. I do think Gardener Supply has those now or something very similar. Anyway, we'll find a link and put it down below for you if you're interested. Lindsay said, thank you for this video. A question, your beds are 12 inches high and I think your parents are a shorter height. They are. Is this just personal preference? I don't think so. I think that they just use those because that's what they used at the time. And I think if they were to rebuild those beds, they would use a little bit more beefy boards. I've heard my mom say that. Uh, Ashley said, I noticed at the beginning of the video, you showed a clip of you adding your leaf mulch and bone meal that you did in the fall. How did that do for you? Did it break down as you hoped? It did really well. In most of the beds, it created like a really kind of like moist, broken down mat. Um, like the leaves didn't fully decompose. We had a really dry, dry winter. Had we had more moisture, I think they would have broken down further, but they were really nice and they were great to work into the soil. So I'm really happy with how that worked out. Nicole said, is it the angle or do the arborvitas look like they fluffed out a bit? They have definitely fluffed out a bit. I am really, really happy with the growth rate of those. And that's been kind of Aaron's pet project. And he has been the one, he fertilized all of them himself this, this spring. And he is the one who monitors all the water and they're doing really well. That kind of leads into the next question. Kimberly said, question on the North Pole Arbs next to the fence line behind you. I think I remember you spacing them four feet apart on center. Now that they're larger, are you still happy with the spacing or do you think you would change it if you have to do it over again? Because it looks like she's getting ready to do the same thing. 
So we chose a four foot spacing. I think it's just under four feet, isn't it? Like 40, 40 inches. inches is what we spaced those. And I think it's a good spacing because it said these plants get anywhere from three to five feet wide. So we chose something on the lower end of middle, <laughs> like middle ground is the four foot. So we did a few inches shorter than that because in the end we do want them to be touching and we hope based on their growth rate, I think we're gonna get there. Um, so yeah, I think the 40 inch spacing is really perfect. Okay, last video you guys was the DIY calendula salve. And in that video, I just showed you the process just because it was something that I was making. I grew the Lady Godiva yellow calendulas last year. They did great in our cold frame this winter to the point where they bloomed most of the winter. So I was able to harvest them, dry them, make the oil, make the salve, and it was a really fun project and easy, really. Stacy Ann said, I have calendula in my garden, but the PW ones are so pretty and would, I would love to add those. Would they grow in San Antonio? I think I'm a zone nine. Yes, they're like a zone seven through 11, so they'll probably be a perennial for you. Uh, Nancy said, could you still use the flower heads you cut off the first time? Find a way to get the bugs off. For those of us that do not have a greenhouse for that second bloom, they will keep blooming all summer long. Like you can have, uh, you can cut them back several different times and they'll just keep flushing back growth. No greenhouse needed. The only reason I put them in here is because they happened to be in a container and it was warm enough to where they were able to bloom in here. And that was kind of a one-off. I don't expect that to happen every single winter, but in the summertime when you have them planted outside, uh, if they get some aphids on them and you know, like I say, I let mine get like really bad with aphids because they're a great host plant. Then I cut back the affected foliage and let them flush back again. They do it so fast outside that it's almost like they don't skip a beat. I don't typically use the flowers off those because the aphids get pretty thick. But if you wanted to take the time to try to wash all those aphids off, you certainly could. Uh, Donna said, I really enjoyed this video and would love to see more like this. Now I just need to find some calendula. Do you think it would be difficult to start from seed? Well, the Lady Godiva yellow and orange are a type that are almost sterile because they're fully double flowers where it makes it very hard for them to set seed, which is a good thing in one, on one hand because sometimes you don't want the plant to seed itself all over the place, which most varieties of calendulas will do. And sometimes you want them to seed themselves all over the place. Um, so I have a variety in a seed packet inside that I plan on direct seeding outside. And it is very easy to do if you're wanting to do different varieties than the ones I talked about today. Elle said, can you use fresh instead of dried calendula flowers? No, you need to use dried calendula flowers because if you were to use fresh, like in this oil infusion, you may deal with some mold issues. So make sure that your flowers are dried out. And last question was from Vic. Laura, how long would you heat the oil if you were going to use the hot method? So if you were gonna do the water bath method, which makes the oil infusion happen a lot quicker, you would use like a canning jar or a canning pot that has a little rack that you can set your jar in so it's not sitting right at the bottom of your pot. So it's raised up a bit and then you do the water level about halfway up your jar and then you get the water to a simmering point and then you turn the heat off and then you let it just sit there and infuse in that hot water bath and then you do the same thing for like several times over 24 hour period and that will make the infusion happen a lot faster. And I just chose to go kind of the easy route and I put it on a windowsill that doesn't get direct sun, but it's a really bright spot. And then I just shook it once a day. Uh, and I found that that worked really well for me. And that's it, you guys. I feel like this video was longer than the rest of our recap videos. I feel like I'm saying that every single week. I don't know, it's really hard to choose questions, to be honest with you. Like I go through and there's so many good questions. I try to pick ones out that I notice have been asked more than one time so that I may be answering uh, multiple people's questions at the same time while answering one question, if that makes sense. But I really appreciate all of the comments and questions and opinions that you guys give in our videos because it does, um, I don't know, it's just a really fun community that we have here. So anyway, I hope you guys all have a really great week and we will see you in the next video. Bye.